you know, we, we set trends, we're able to be, you know, the tastemakers, we're able to be the people who are, who are regulating what's happening, you know, in the streets and in fashion. Abroad. So, you know, that's why you all deserve the flowers, you know, that we're giving in terms of you all were the originators, you laid the template that right now fashion is being built on, you know, so, you know, I'd love to talk a little bit about like, how did hip hop influence your marketing and your, and your brand? Why, why did they happen so synergistically with you all? And, you know, I, I don't know, Tony, Tony, you want to start off? Believe that? Yeah, yeah, no. Um, for me, I grew up on those mean streets of Seattle. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, um, yeah, wasn't, wasn't mean streets at all. And hip hop wasn't, you know, a burl away from me. Hip hop was 3000 miles away from me. And, uh, and I mean it like that. So for me watching all the, my dad had, um, a, a closed circuit TV situation set up in the house so we could watch Ralph McDaniels, all that stuff. Uh, we were always listening to the, to the radio, listen to all the rap groups, obviously, you know, in junior high, we were trying to be, you know, who didn't want to be the Sugar Hill Gang or the Funky Four Plus One More. That was me. We were those kids and we loved, we adored hip hop. And, you know, you know, from, I mean, we watched, shoot, man, we were watching break dancing and all that kind of stuff. So we were influenced by it, but we're, you know, grew up in a different, different fashion perspective. So, um, you know, when we saw artists wearing lead jeans, we wanted lead jeans. When we saw, you know, for us, when we saw Ice Cube and those guys rocking, you know, starter jackets, we were trying to get starter jackets in the story. That that's what our that's what our vision was from the artist perspective. Um, and then I moved to New York, and once I moved to New York, it was it was a wrap. You know, that's when I was like, ooh, I'm going in, Jack. And that's when I started meeting people. And I came to New York in '89, 1989. So I lived in the village. So. Even that perspective was different from the borough, pers the borough's perspective, the different boroughs. Like it wasn't rough and tough like leather in the village. You know, cats were rocking different colored vans, all the fly jeans. We were dyeing Jerbo jeans. You know, we'd buy the white ones and me and Londa would dye them all different colors and out there with the brand next Jerbo's killing cats. And so that was our fashion, you know, for me. And so, but it wasn't until, you know, when you see an artist wear stuff, it wasn't as, as contrived as planned as I, we didn't realize it wasn't planned. And then, you know, I'm gonna be honest with you. I mean, this is a great segue, right? And then I met April Walker, just like that. And that's when I saw that the shit was a plan. I'm like, oh, you actually got these people to wear this shit? They just didn't wear it? Nah. And so, but, you know, to your credit, April, you service the community. You were like, oh, here's the stuff for you. Here's the stuff for you. And the customer service was amazing. Because April didn't even realize she had customer service, but her her um her ability to be able to say, we're gonna do this right, we're gonna do this on time, we're gonna give the people the right stuff. So if an artist had ordered something from April and it was the wrong size or something, or let's just say I delivered the wrong thing, she'd be like, yo, I got a phone call, come back. And I would then take the right stuff to that artist, in this particular case, Biggie, and then she would give it to him for free. He wouldn't even have to pay for it. It was customized for him or anybody else from, from you name it, from uh, the artist, the list goes on, from uh, Big Daddy Kane, the list goes on. So I didn't start seeing my real true understanding of how to work with artists until April showed me. So I'll put it out, I'll, I'll let you take it from there. I was about to say, sometimes they pay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they definitely pay, they definitely pay. <laughs> But the funny part about it, the funny part about it, like we we could we could barely keep up. Once we started going, we could barely keep up. I mean, the demand was was nutty central, and so right. I I will just say, and I I'm sure you guys could jump in, but but definitely I was one of the first in terms of, one of the first in terms of the product placement blueprint, um and and with that I saw that I couldn't compete with a Tommy Hilfiger or a Ralph Lauren. But what I did know was my tribe because I was the tribe. I was that reflection. I was actually in those spots from the Palladium on. And my crew was too. We were all working and building relationships. So yeah. for all of you out there, <clears throat> relationships are still valuable. 
And I would say, don't count on just texting, get in front of people, meet them, live in your discomfort zone. We were fearless. We did a great job at that. And we went for what we knew and we what we wanted. And then beyond that, we were willing to be patient. Like entrepreneurship is a long game. So building relationships and helping people, if you believe in them and you show them that early on, they're going to believe in you. And more than not, they're going to remember that. And when people ask me about Tupac and Biggie and this and that, they remember that. And so I would say, don't discount that. Always let the product lead, but know that if your product is on point and you're building relationships and you say who you are and you mean what you say, it counts for a lot. Right. And on that note, you know, the big thing for me is like we would never mince words. You know, when we built the brands, it was like, you know, and I always tell people like this, it was easy to be able to jump off of April's coattails and then go start Mecca. So when I started Mecca, I had a blueprint, but I still had to do the work. And, you know, that's another part of it, like being able to. And this is a great segue because I can do product placement all day. But if I can't make the clothes, if I can't ship them, if I can't deliver them. And in this particular case, if I can't set up the photo shoots and everything else that comes with it, I mean, there's a whole multitude of prongs that go with this. You know, it looks cute. Like I'm dealing with a young man right now called Voto Santo. Um, and uh, my guy, Pat, Stuart's was like, he got a sample. Samples came in. Some came in dope. Some came in wacky. I'm like, dude, figure it out. Figure out how to shoot it. And you've got to figure out how to shoot it. So, you know, and... That was like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Maurice, you also have a have a relationship with hip hop at the roots. Like right now, we we've had you know product placement. We've talked about now. You know, you use and you created a platform called <laughs> Hip Hop Shop. Talk to us a little bit about that way or that avenue for marketing your brand by creating a live platform. Yeah, before uh, social media, had to hit the parties and uh, promote that way. Uh, luckily, when I was like really young, still in high school, high school it was like the brand with this the surf Kool-Aid, you know, uh, was making clothes and friends come over. They bought clothes, luggage. That's what they wanted for free. <laughs> That's, that's how I met you. <laughs> that's how I met you coming over to get close. <laughs> Luckily, like word of mouth, like, like tell one guy uh, or do a t-shirt promo, somebody will say, uh, where'd you get that from? And then he'll send like his friend over and then his friends and two friends and two friends and four friends. and. It just kept building. But that was due to, at the time, uh, it was like nobody producing clothes the way that we saw and that knew that you know we you know, we wanted to wear things and what 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 we thought would look good. Uh, I remember stopping and going into the the gap when gap so when we guys. And uh, buying, uh, yeah, wow. Levi's, and I just couldn't get them to fit right in the butt. Like, uh, it, it was just, they were like, it was, I had to get on a couple sizes too big just to fit the way I wanted it to look. And that was what inspired me later to, like, uh, when I uh, made the like logo, um, Blue Jeans for Your Ass, it was. To jeans that fit the way that we wanted them, as a youth to to wear our clothes. Uh, and my style has always been not like giant baggy, but just like loose enough to be comfortable. And uh, where you still had that style, but now you're comfortable. You know, where like we are just a couple years off of the seeing hip hop artists with like. Tight shorts. <laughs> I look at proof. That picture of proof. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. You know, again, you all were on the edge of what's happening in terms of fashion, Maurice. You know, again, I, I, 
remember, you know, I helped you get your your, store, your clothes in Salem V because I was heard about this stuff. I went and bought the clothes, you know, I got a gift of the clothes as well. And I was like, this is the kind of I've never seen. And we were doing fashion shows. That was our promotion doing like fashion shows and parties. I was like, I had to wear many different hats. I was a DJ, motor, uh, you know, when I was hustling on it. You, to, to be successful, you, you have to have, like Angel said, a hustler spirit. Wish my employees now had that. Well, you know, that's that's what we're hoping to do, and that's really one of the goals of, of what we're doing here is to connect you all as mentors to the community, and you know, each of you talk about how you've mentored and or been mentored. You know, you've had relationships with somebody who's helped you, and so what you're doing now, you know, you know, we gotta we gotta give love to the fact well, well, Dave, to the young people. Well, Dave, day. the one thing we definitely should talk about, like this is another thing too. Cats, I feel like um, you have to be willing to be open-minded and you have to be willing to do anything. So, you know, I bring this to the story of like, I said to myself, I've got to work no matter what. Winning the race didn't have a blueprint all the time. So, you, but, but one thing that did work was working. One thing that did work was jumping in and not asking a zillion questions, but just, okay, how can, you know, the basics is we got to get this done. And so... And again, I, I, I have fun pushing this back over to April because we would be going everywhere. We're going to go to the source boards and we're not going to be there to watch the source boards. We're going just to work, to give people clothes, to, to talk to people, to meet people, to work on these relationships. And I feel like the younger people have to understand that. Did I get paid that day? Not necessarily. I mean, I just worked for April. So whatever it was, we just went up and we worked. Uh, i never forget when we went to Freaknik and we're in the elevator with... Um, we're sitting in the elevator, Craig Mack, and he's singing this song called Flavor in Your Ear. And he's got, he's singing, he's listening to it on a Walkman, and he's got a tape. And I'm like, who's this goober dude listening to this song? And April and I are like going to the room. We're at the Swiss Hotel. Remember that, April? And we were going to Freak Nick. We were down there for Freak Nick. Yeah. We were promoting the brand at Freak Nick. Uh -huh. Puffy was in the president's suite. Luke was in, Luke was in the governor's suite. Uh, Craig Mack was in the elevator. We went to Puffy's room and there was a piano and Jodeci was playing the piano and Usher was singing and Biggie was rapping. Like, But we were there to work and we were hustling. And it seems glorious and it's a great story, but the real reality was I was there to work. I was there to get accounts and do sales and go see accounts. And right after that, you know, we had another day in, in Atlanta, but then we were, on the, we, were, we were in Atlanta to go on the road to see accounts. And so outside of that fun day, I was selling clothes and making sure we had line sheets, making sure the samples were all there, making sure that when we were selling it, we had inventory. So you just got to be willing to hustle it and don't overthink it. What is it? Analysis paralysis, paralysis by analysis. And so, you know, yeah. sometimes you can have a plan, but don't, don't wrap your head so much around the plan that without this is not going to work. You have to be willing to move and shake. To Maurice's point, you know, you have to be willing to do whatever it takes. Oh, what the fuck? Yeah, I always, I always tell uh, staff and other young designers. So for me, I realized that I could make it when I learned how to be a problem solver. That's and it. That's what entrepreneurship is. Problems always come. If no staff, you get around them. That allows you to move forward. And if you, you, you let something, you, you run against the wall, and you're like, oh, this wall is here, I can't get it. You got to figure out how to get there, around it, over it, go through it, you got to figure it out. Because another one is going to come. Right. That's, that's, I it. Say, that's, that's it. it. That's that's it. You know, it's just vital. Go ahead, April. Sorry. No, I just was going to say exactly what he said in a different way. Make the naysayers yaysayers. Yeah. And the make, what you make the naysayers yaysayers is, like you said, you go around, you dig a hole, you go underground, but you can knock down the wall. And maybe you don't right at that moment. But a lot of things at that moment, it's a pause because you have a lesson there. And then you get over, over that wall. You get around it. But don't stop, you know. And and be willing to learn. I would say being, hum being humble, humility and confidence can live in the same house. And just remember that because that's how you grow. 
And people, don't, don't be afraid. And people, people don't mind watching you hustle. People don't mind you trying. And then, you know, you can, you can be losing, but people like respect the fact that you're, you're like, okay, I'm gonna give it a shot and, and just keep on trying. And it may not be like what they say, you want to make God laugh, tell them what you got planned. And so with that being said, you know, I, I want to leave with young people like, Hey, look, find a way. And it's not going to always be as comfortable. Be willing to be uncomfortable, you know, be willing to be uncomfortable. There's no success in the comfort zone. I, w- I would say I would say the one thing all three have in common and it applies today as much as it did day one is we all came from authentic places and we all lived our truth, right? Yeah. And so authenticity matters and people can see through the bullshit. So don't bullshit others and be who you are because your story is a unique story that's different than everybody else's in the world. And if you live in that, and you figure out a way now with storytelling so big, if you do authentic storytelling with dope product, people wanna see you in the basement hustling. They wanna see that climb with you. And they watched us do that from the basement on up slowly. And I think that, you know what, there's so many other people in the basement or that are champion or wanna champion an underdog. And so that's what entrepreneurship is. So, so, so make that story big. By, by sharing it, sharing, don't be awesome, be flossome. Like, look, I'm learning, I'm growing, stick right. with me. This is what we're about to do. Right, and then on that, you know, that's the fun part about that is that, you know, when we were building all these brands and everybody was doing their thing, I used to tell cats like, look, you know, when we decided to, oh, Mecca was great, but we're gonna build a new brand. We had to really go back into our bag of tricks and figure out what are gonna be the new angles, what are gonna be the new direction. And now when you look at kids on social, I mean, social is a hot mess. It's the same old, same old, same old, same old, same old, same old. How do you stand out of that crowd? It's the same concept because we had to stand out of crowds, but we didn't have the budgets like Tommy or Ralph. We had to figure out how we were going to move around without those budgets. Like, how do you move social around? How, how, how analytical are you with paying attention to what's really going on in social and digital? And I always tell cats, don't be afraid to take a class here or there. Don't be afraid to get the cheat code and go learn a couple things and then apply that to your work. That's right. That's right. Everybody on this call teaches in multiple areas. And I'm still, we got it. We got, you know, still taking class. Exactly. We teach, we learn. Keep learning. Things constantly change. Absolutely. One thing that you when you, when you're going to learn that you don't. That's important. That's the and most important like there's, part. There's a you ton know, of people yeah. around you. Start asking people. Go on chats. Go on. Go come on webinars like this. Go and look and see what's going on. And then ask a million questions. Ask questions that apply to you. That's my thing. Is ask questions that apply to you. So I ask questions all the time. I was just at. So yeah. I mean, so I have right. a big client. I have a big client. It's called my client's called Starter, right? And so this is this is sports licensing. And I'm like, okay. I'm learning it as I go. I'm learning this sports license thing like there's nobody's business. And boy, oh boy, am I having the best time because I'm like, oh, word. But now, now that it's like this, but you know what? We should do it like this. I got something for you. And I just take the magic that I know I got and I flip it towards that. I flip what they taught me the other day and I do mean the other day and I'm already just running it on them. They're like, wow, okay. But my whole point is, I wasn't afraid to just try. I've been calling people for the last four months. I've been calling people and asking them about different things about licensing. How do I handle this? How do I handle this question? Who is this person? Who is that person? And just can't be afraid to just, you know, learn. Like here I am, I've done this before, built and sold companies, and there I am a student again on licensing. Right. Was- you know, again, you, you, you find and you surround yourself with the best and that's how you're able to, to pivot. Hey, but what were you gonna say? I was like, and you keep learning. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's vital, Life, lifetime learning. Again, that's what making a brand's about, that's what all of the people here use, and you're constantly teaching people and you're constantly learning.